This is the story of Larry, the Maryland Blue Crab, Part 2. The following morning, we loaded the crab into the car and were on the road for Michigan at 8.45 a.m. Because we were picking up friends and visiting museums along the way, we broke the drive up to Michigan into two parts. Eventually, we arrived at our lodging in the evening of the second day. For the next two days, we toured various hobby shops as well as the Western Michigan Model Railroad Club. During this time, Sam was subject to almost constant reminders from Brad that he needed to rent an air compressor for the crab. He was already well aware of it and found the reminders mildly annoying. On our third day in Michigan, we planned on visiting White Creek in the afternoon after a tour of Bruce Chubb's iconic Sunset Valley Model Railroad. I somewhat breezed through the layout tour, though. I was just eager to get to White Creek. From Bruce's, we split and went two ways. The two Jakes went to Mr. Abel's house to pick up his flat car, and the rest of us went to a Sunbelt Rentals near Grand Rapids to rent the air compressor. Once we had it, we visited a local Home Depot to get a few air fittings and hoses. We then headed for White Creek. We pulled into Hidden Valley Yard on the White Creek Railroad around 3 p.m. The two Jakes had not yet arrived. I'll tell you the truth, I knew we'd attract some attention with the strange blue contraption we had, so I was a little hesitant about unloading. After a few minutes, though, we backed the truck up to the steaming bay and lifted the crab's crate out. As soon as we had it on the bay, one of the White Creek regulars, a guy by the name of Dennis, came over and asked about the engine. When he heard the story behind the crab, he mentioned that he wanted to sit down with us at some point and do an interview for a magazine article. We talked for a bit before the two Jakes drove in with the flat car. After a quick walk to the engine house to sign the guest book, I attached the drawbar and did a quick oil around on the crab while Jake Abel removed the rear seat from his flat car so we could mount the air compressor. I then walked the crab down the steaming bay ramp and backed it into the siding with the flat car. We heaved the compressor onto the back of the flat car and attached an air hose to it, which we ran to the crab's tank. Jake removed one knuckle from his flat car and the other end of the drawbar was bolted into the coupler pocket. We then secured the compressor to the flat car with tag-along straps. With everything assembled, we fired up the compressor and built air pressure. This was it. All those months of work by all involved was about to be put to the test. The crab had moved itself in static tests and had putted across a concrete garage floor, but now it was on rails and under load. Would it run? Would it slip? Would some other problem crop up? Would it have enough power to move itself and the flat car behind it? There was only one way to find out. I spun the main rods one rotation in reverse to set the engine's slip eccentrics into forward and put her in gear. Sam took the engineer's seat and opened the throttle. Locked up. What? Okay. Hit. Hang on, it was, it was sliding there. The first run of any locomotive is always an exciting moment. We were ecstatic, but we also had discovered a new gremlin to deal with. When the locomotive was coasting, the slack in the rods let out just enough so as to cause the crosshead to touch the packing gland on one cylinder, and thus cause the running gear to jam. Some simple filing could fix it, but we didn't have a file with us. One of the White Creek regulars said there should be a file in the railroad shop. We got a lift from a powered caboose, I kid you not, and took the crab up there. We got the crab into the shop and found a file. After a minor collision between a Dash 9 and a member of our crew, I got down on all fours and got to work. I filed a little metal off the offending crosshead and would turn the rods by hand to see if everything cleared. After a few minutes, I figured I'd gotten the crosshead filed down enough. We pulled the crab back out of the shop, put it in gear, and fired the compressor up. This time Sam had me take the throttle. With Jake Abel walking alongside to act as a brake, I ran the crab back and forth, letting it drift as much as I could. The locomotive performed flawlessly. When I rolled back up to the rest of the crew watching from the shop doors, I declared, Gentlemen, we have a locomotive!
We took the crab back down to the steam bay yard and let all the guys in our group take the throttle for a little back and forth run. Then it was time to take the crab for a real run. I was a little nervous about sending the crab out by itself, though, so Jake Abel arranged for me to ride with someone else behind the crab. The first run was going to be a simple one. The crab would run from Hidden Valley Yard to the loop at Reed Lake and back. Sam again took the throttle, and we headed for Reed Lake. Bradley. The trip to Reed Lake went fine. We met one train that was on its way back and otherwise had clear signals. The crab maintained air pressure beautifully as well, although we were going downhill, so... Anyways, we rounded Reed Lake and began working up the hill back to Hidden Valley Yard. The air compressor was working furiously. Sam worked the throttle enough to keep a somewhat decent pace up the hill. We made it through Oakley and halfway up the next part of the hill before the air pressure had dropped to the point where Sam had to stop to allow the compressor to catch up. When he had full air pressure, we continued to Hillside, where Sam stopped again to make sure he had full air pressure before going through the tunnel that separates Hillside and Hidden Valley Yard. Sam didn't want to be stopped in a tunnel with a running gas engine, understandably. We covered the final distance to the yard and were met by the rest of the crew. We moved the crab to the steam bay yard and I looked it over. One of the crosshead guides had come loose and was dangling off the locomotive, but everything else was fine. I started to get some tools out to make the simple repair. However, others in the group had different plans. Jake Abel wanted to take us all on a grand tour of the railroad. I told them to go ahead without me, but they insisted I come along. One complete circuit of the five miles of track later, we were back in Hidden Valley. I again started to pull the tools out, but it was about 7 p.m. and everyone wanted to go find some dinner. I again made known my desire to make the repairs, but the consensus was, we'll do it when we get back. We piled into the car and went down the road to the local Big Boy Burger. By the time we had gotten back to the railroad, darkness had fallen. The other guys were getting ready to move the crab to the car barn for overnight storage when I said, That thing is not moving until I fix that crosshead guide! With flashlights providing just enough light to work from and my own feeling around, I got the errant crosshead guide back where it was supposed to be. We then fired up the compressor and moved the crab into the car barn as quickly as possible so as to minimize the disturbance to those camping at the railroad. Once the crab was squared away, we called it a day. And thus concluded our first day at White Creek. Stay tuned, the rest of the story is coming up.